So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our viewers from around the world. Uh, Lynn Orr and I will be your hosts for today's Global Energy Dialogue. Uh, this will also be our last Global Energy Dialogue for 2020. And we just wanna thank all of the 7,000 people that have joined us uh, over, the, over the course of the past six months or so. So this has been uh, quite, quite a year. We began our dialogues with a discussion about COVID-19 and the impacts of um, COVID-19 on energy utilization. Uh, and we've spanned a huge range of topics all the way through uh, energy access and climate change. And we have a terrific collection of videos. So I encourage you to take a look at those at gef.stanford.edu. So our dialogue today will consider the impact of changes in the U.S. energy and climate landscape from the perspective of our Stanford experts in energy technology and policy. Uh, and, and of course, the U.S. election has changed the outlook for U.S. participation in efforts uh, around the world to deal with climate change and the worldwide clean energy transition that is now underway. So we're really fortunate to have a, a large panel of Stanford energy experts, people with deep expertise in uh, their respective fields. So we'll hear from them briefly in turn, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions and we would really like to have a lively discussion with you. So we're going to start with energy efficiency. And to talk about this, we have uh, Diane Grunick, who is a pre-court energy scholar uh, a member of the Schultz Stevenson Energy Policy Task Force at the Hoover Institution and an affiliated scholar with the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Uh, she was a commissioner uh, on the Public Utilities Commission from 2005 to 2010. And she's a deep expertise in energy efficiency, demand response, smart grid, renewables, uh, and climate change. So, uh, so, so Diane, for you, you know, every bit of energy that we don't use in the future is energy that doesn't need to be provided with low greenhouse gas emissions. So what is the potential for significant improvements in energy efficiency going forward? Uh, and what do you think are the most exciting opportunities? Thanks so much, Sally, and hello to everyone out there. Um, I really wanna emphasize that energy efficiency is probably the most critical tool that we have for addressing climate change, because not only does it reduce carbon emissions, but it saves money to individuals, to businesses, to our entire economy. So it's an incredibly important tool. Um, according to the International Energy Agency, we need to get about 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions from energy efficiency over the next 20 years. So again, its importance is critical. But in a report that the IEA released just last week, there's some disturbing news in this area that we're looking at in 2020, our energy efficiency investments internationally are going to go down about 10% from last year. And that's because of coronavirus, our economic downturn, shutdown of buildings. So, Frankly, we all need to double down on what we can do in this area. Now there's a lot of economic stimulus packages and that's a big opportunity that many of them are including additional funding and programs for energy efficiency, which can be ramped up very quickly and provide great jobs. So that's one area of great opportunity is to focus on our economic stimulus packages that are going to be coming out over the next year or two. I'm gonna just quickly end with two areas that I'm very excited about. The first is intelligent efficiency. And that's the additional energy efficiency that's possible with information and communication technologies where we're looking at sensors, connected devices, networks, data analytics. And so we have the ability to have smart buildings that can really be optimized in terms of how much energy they use, comfort for the occupants, et cetera. But they then can be connected to our grid. And these smart buildings then become a building block 
for how we can bring in our renewables, our storage demand response. There's a lot of opportunity in this new area in terms of technology, policy, finance. The second area, just real quickly, is building decarbonization. In the United States, our buildings account for about 40% of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, 40%. And about half of that is from the fossil fuels we actually burn inside our buildings, natural gas, propane, and heating oil. So we need to be really smart about how we're gonna decrease that fossil usage within our buildings, both our new buildings, but existing buildings. So I'll end with saying I'm involved now with a really exciting new effort at Stanford, which we um, will be launching next year. It's called the Stanford Building Decarbonization Learning Accelerator. It will be a free online uh, resource that will provide very uh, highly curated material to lecturers, to faculty, to students, to practitioners throughout the world about teaching building decarbonization. So I'll end now, but it's really an exciting new endeavor we're doing here at Stanford. Great, thank you, uh, Diane, for getting us started in a, in a good way. Um, so next, uh, we're gonna hear from Ram Rajakapal. He's an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering and a senior fellow at the Precord Institute for Energy and professor by courtesy of electrical engineering. Uh, he directs the Sustainable Systems Lab here where research focuses on power systems and that includes the integration of renewables, smart distribution systems and demand side data analytics, the, many of the kinds of things that, uh, that uh, Diane mentioned. So, so Ram, um, there have been deep reductions in the costs of renewables and like wind and solar uh, in the last decade or so. And uh, deployment at scale is, is continuing, although it certainly has a way to go. What kind of modifications to the grid, including storage, are going to be needed in order to manage that uh, um, operation of a grid with lots of uh, intermittent uh, renewable resources on it? <clears throat> Lynn, this is an excellent question. Um, you know, the, the first thing to, to acknowledge is that there is no silver bullet. But overall, we will need to move from a supply meets demand paradigm to one of flexible matching of resources. Let me just start with technology. We will need to integrate short term and seasonal storage solutions and combine that with the coordination of the demand side, including you know, things like EV charging, distributed storage and smart loads. Um, in doing this, we certainly will have to do it in a way that preserves the reliability of the whole system. Um, in addition, we are seeing some trends such as the deployment of microgrids to increase local resiliency, and they will offer additional grid flexibility. Um, in, in this conversation on the technology side, uh, consideration will have to be given to uh, DC transmission network solutions, wherever it's cost effective and integrated with the rest of the uh, grid. Um, and something that uh, Diane brought up, which is what I would say are grid measurable energy efficiency measures. That means we can actually measure their impact on the base load and communicate to the system operations. But I think we need to go significantly beyond just the technologies. Um, I think if we want to support deeper penetration of renewables, planning will have to change. It has to account for significant uncertainty that we have in what technologies will be available, what their costs are gonna be, what the weather patterns are gonna be. And we have to include a lot of different criteria that we have not done in the past, including life cycle emissions costs, helping, health impacts and equity. On the operations side, I feel um, we need to develop kind of a new generation of algorithms that will leverage a scalable AI and optimization um, that are risk aware and will be used to operate all these resources. And, uh, you know, finally, we, we certainly need to redesign markets and, and create various market mechanisms and policies to appropriately engage and compensate these participants. I think uh, 
in, and, and just to, to, to put in some uh, closing words, I think um, there will be large amounts of sensing that, that will be deployed. Uh, power electronics is a big enabler of, of this transformation as well. Um, but we will need to think about how to facilitate the flow um, and the integration of resources by having various forms of open standards. So it's a quite complex problem, but it's very, very exciting. Okay, well, thanks very much, Rob. Um, so now we're gonna move on to something completely different. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, natural gas. So over the past 15 years or so, there's really been a revolution in the ability to discover and produce uh, natural gas at a very big scale. Uh, the US is the largest producer of natural gas today. And to talk about the role of natural gas in the, in the clean energy future, we have Mark Zoback, who is the Benjamin M. Page Professor of Geophysics and the director of Stanford, Stanford's Natural Gas Initiative. The initiative fo focuses on the major advances in natural gas production and how that can affect the clean energy transition. So uh, over to you, Mark. So, so what role can natural gas play in enabling large scale deployment of renewable energy? Well, th uh, thank you, Sally, and good morning, everyone. Um, you know, in fact, uh, my engagement with the Natural Gas Initiative was seeing natural gas as uh, an enabler for renewables. Uh, the primary need is to decarbonize the energy system, but a high priority, whether you live in California or the developing world, is the need for reliable power, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. And in 2019 in California, uh, we had 18 gigawatts of solar and wind installed and operating. Um, a massive amount of power, but it had a three gigawatt average utilization over the year. So the intermittency of renewables is is, is a real fact. And um, in California, you know, we in many other places we need a daily backup uh, uh, for uh, demand exceeding supply, and maybe massive battery installations will address this. But in California and in many other parts of the world, we also have longer term needs uh, for seasonal storage. Um, at a massive scale. Um, and so natural gas uh, coupled with carbon capture and storage is really the only option we have today to back up electrical power systems with large scale deployment of intermittent resources and to provide reliable power at scale uh, for economic development in the many parts of the world that are now uh, highly dependent on coal. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions is truly a, a global problem. And so if we shift our focus to where um, a lot of growth is going to occur, future emissions are going to occur, you know, we, we have to look at the developing world. But economic development requires reliable power, whether it's refrigeration for uh, a grocery store or power for manufacturing. And the demographic trend of people in the developing world is concentrated, is the concentration of large numbers of people in mega cities that require a lot of energy in a limited amount of area. So um, natural gas isn't the end game, but it's for the next couple of decades until perhaps hydrogen comes on at scale or there's a nuclear renaissance or um, some other uh, solutions uh, come forward Right now, natural gas coupled with carbon capture and storage is gonna play a critical role for the energy transition to succeed. So thank you, Mark. And actually thank you for uh, providing a very nice transition to the, to the next topic, which is carbon capture and storage. Um, and for that, we'll turn to Sally Benson. Sally's a, a internationally recognized energy expert with uh, deep expertise in energy systems and in carbon capture and storage uh, uh, specifically. She's the Precourt Family Professor and Professor of uh, Energy Resources Engineering here at Stanford. Um, she has lots of background. She served as director of the Global Climate and Energy Project here. Uh, and then uh, in payment for all of that, she got to be director of the uh, Precourt Institute and co-director over the last seven years. 
And before that, she was at Lawrence Berkeley Lab where she was uh, the Associate Lab Director for Energy Sciences and then the Deputy Director of the entire uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So um, she really does have the background to talk about this. So Sally, um, uh, Mark alluded to this, um, uh, the question of, of uh, carbon capture and storage. What role should CCS play in decarbonizing electricity? And, and also you might comment on the other hard to decarbonize uh, uh, industry settings that are important here in California and around the world. Okay, um, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, so, so the way I think about carbon capture and storage is that it's a, a subset of a broad category of technologies that can either reduce carbon emissions or offset them directly. So we're not relying on a substitute for, for fossil fuels, for example, but we're just you know, going head on to reduce emissions from that. And, and just to give you some examples of what these technologies are. So they fall, I think, into two big bins. One is what we would call natural climate solutions. Uh, and that's things like uh, planting forests or uh, changing our agricultural practices so that we can accommodate more carbon in the soils. And, and the second category is um, carbon capture and storage on industrial sources so that we can put, for example, a scrubber uh, on the smokestack of a power plant and we can capture those emissions and we can uh, compress them and turn them into a liquid and then and basically pump them deep underground. Basically, you can think of putting that carbon back underground where it came from in the first place. So those are the two broad categories. And then there's a hybrid of those, which combines natural climate solutions with, with uh, industrial carbon capture and storage. And that's something called bioenergy plus CCS, where for example, you would use uh, um, um, biomass feedstocks to produce power uh, and then capture and store those emissions. Um, those kind of technologies sort of have great current relevance in places like California, where our forests need uh, significant um, effort to pull out uh, old dead stock and so forth to help prevent forest fires. So, so what is the role of these technologies? Uh, you know, there's clearly, you know, huge progress in renewable generation, but as Mark uh, Zoback pointed out, that getting the 24-7, 365 reliability that we need, even with demand response, uh, we really aren't there yet in terms of doing that with just renewable and, and shorter long duration storage. So carbon capture and storage can play a key role. Um, in, in California, uh, we've done studies which, which indicate that uh, you know, if we had say 15 gigawatts of, of um, uh, natural gas combined cycle plants with carbon capture and storage, really cost effectively and very quickly uh, decarbonize the California electricity system. And you'd be using massive amounts of renewables, but that, that natural gas would provide a backstop the other very important role for carbon capture and storage is in the hard to abate sectors, the industrial sectors like cement plants and steel plants and chemical production facilities. We just don't have good substitutes for those technologies today and we can't afford to wait uh, until we can uh, de decarbonize, decarbonize those another way. So that's very important. Uh, and just one more point, in the long run, carbon capture and storage uh, is going to play a, a very important role in creating something that we call negative emissions. Uh, it's highly likely we're going to overshoot the total amount of emissions that will uh, enable us to limit warming to two degrees C. But if we can capture, if we can capture carbon from the atmosphere through direct air capture or bioenergy plus CCS or through uh, carbon management in forests and so forth, we can offset those emissions and, and we can then uh, get on a pathway to achieving uh, limiting warming to two degrees C. So those are what uh, I see as important roles for carbon capture and storage. Um, but that's going to bring us uh, to a, another topic. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, energy storage. And to talk about this um, and, and other issues, we have uh, Yi Shui, who's a professor of material science and engineering at Stanford and of photon science at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. And he focuses on nanomaterials for energy storage, solar cells, 
uh, insulators and biology. He's uh, uh, definitely uh, someone of many talents and interests. But uh, for, for this conversation, uh, Yi, we'd like to know, what do you think is the state of play for battery storage, uh, particularly for EVs? Because we're seeing the beginning of a revolution of transition to EVs. And you know, can we expect that uh, today's ch chemistries or even new chemistries will support uh, continued reduction in battery costs, which are going to be critical towards the, the scaling uh, and wide-scale wide, uh, wide deployment of, of EVs around the world. Well, thanks, Sally. Um, uh, on behalf of uh, my co-director of Storage X Wheelchair, I think uh, I'm very excited to share a few points with everybody here. Uh, the first, if you look at what happened in the past decade, past decade, the battery's pack, the pack level cost is reduced from somewhere around $1,200 per kilowatt hour to today, roughly slightly below $150 per kilowatt hour. So I'm talking about eight times cost reduction. So this is very exciting. I think we have a reason to say to celebrate a little bit, you know, what, what happened in the cost of learning curve. Uh, that enable the electrical vehicles coming up like crazy. Then you, we ask the question, we say, what, what's the challenges right there to continue to reduce the cost? Let me, let me throw one number first. Um, so that's so critical. You look at currently what's the yearly production of lithium ion batteries in say in 10 years, 2030, what, where do we need to get to? we actually need to increase the production roughly by 10 times. What's the number is telling you? I'm talking about a few terawatt hour of battery production. That means we need to build a gigafactory, gigawatt hour, one gigafactory roughly, one gigafactory per day. That's the type of challenge we are facing. These all provide the challenges, the whole supply chain the mining industry, everything needs to go to that scale. So this is a big challenge ahead of us. So with this uh, scaling, we will be able to see the cost continues to go down. Now sitting at $150 per kilowatt hour and the pack level can be cut by half, right? Can we cut the cost by half? I'm very confident this will happen through scaling number one Number two is the new chemistry coming in. For example, um, we are using now the cathode chemistry of lithium that still contain cobalt. Let's move away from cobalt using high nickel. So this is going, this is coming. And then graphite anosite putting in silicon, your energy density can increase by you know, 60 to 80%. This will help reduce the cost as well. So I think this is coming, cutting half is no problem. Then if I, I look further, I say in 20 years, 30 years, well, we want to address even bigger challenge. Maybe let's just mention one point related to the grid scale storage, you know, resonant back to what the RAM is saying and also Mark Sobek is saying, saying um, can we do 24 seven, 365 kind of storage to have reliability on the grid? Um, we need the cost to be even lower. We are looking into 10 times lower, even the storage cost. <clears throat> we don't know how to do that yet. So this will be a big challenge for the whole community. So I'll pause right here. Well, plenty, plenty to think about there, but also plenty of opportunity for uh, storage to have a big impact, particularly in the, in the uh, transportation area. Um, so that, that kind of raises a point that, uh, that I'm going to ask uh, Tom Jaramillo about. Uh, Tom's Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering here at Stanford and Associate Professor of Photon Science at Slack National Laboratory. He directs the SunCat Center for Interface Science and Catalysis, and his research focuses on fundamental catalytic processes that occur on solid state surfaces uh, in both production and consumption of energy. Their, their catalysts are everywhere. Uh, so, Tom, um, what about the idea of using hydrogen uh, to fuel transportation? 
Um, now, obviously, that means you have to make the hydrogen in some pretty big quantities, which presumably will require lots of the electricity that we've uh, just delivered and stored uh, um, uh, with the previous speakers. So, so what do you see, what options are foreseeable for using uh, low carbon electricity, electro electrochemistry and catalysis, and uh, maybe nanostructured materials to make uh, fuels for transportation? Thank you so much for the question, Lynn, and it's really a great pleasure to be here today and be part of this panel. And indeed, there's a tremendous opportunity ahead for hydrogen and for other fuels and chemicals that are produced through sustainable processes. Uh, there are two key points that I would really like to make today. Um, I'll start by stating those two points and we can dive in a little bit deeper. The first point is that today there already exists here and now a massive hydrogen market. Uh, and it's a market with already that's continuing to grow. And there's even a much greater opportunity for growth of that market uh, for new, uh, new uses of hydrogen. So I want to speak to that point in a moment. And the second one, that hydrogen is just one of many important molecules that we already use today and will continue to need in the future. And so really, these hydrogen technologies that I'll be talking about are serving as a flagship in this broader endeavor. Everything that we can do towards hydrogen is we electrify it and sustainably produce it, transport it, store it. We can imagine doing that with other important molecules as well. So let me get back to my first point uh, and just talking about kind of the market demand just to give everyone an idea. It might not be so obvious because we don't go to the store and buy ourselves a, a gallon of hydrogen. Um, what we do buy are lots of products that hydrogen was absolutely essential to make. And the demand as a result is about 65 billion with a B kilograms per year, 65 billion kilograms per year. And so if we just you know, divide that by the number of people on earth, which is over 7 billion these days, it's about nine kilos per person, or about 20 pounds of hydrogen per person. That's the, the average demand per person across the globe. Uh, that, that's a large amount. It's a significant portion of our body weight, if we want to think of it that way. And, and those of us who are on the line, uh, we're consuming probably more than our fair share based on where we're calling in from, uh, calling in from countries that, that probably uh, use uh, more than the average, than the global average of, of hydrogen. Uh, now, that hydrogen, uh, so it's a very important ingredient in lots of things. It's important for uh, oil refining, for sure, uh, as well as in fertilizer production. This is This is how we uh, are able to feed ourselves, literally feed billions of people across the planet. So these are very important uses of hydrogen that already exist today. Uh, we're thankful for uh, the scientists and engineers who developed the tech to convert mostly natural gas is where most of that hydrogen does come from. It almost exclusively comes from fossil fuels, predominantly from natural gas uh, to be able to make these important products. So step one is we already have a large scale market for hydrogen. Can we come up with new technologies that can, that can uh, contribute to that in a sustainable way? But there's also future markets. And if you can come up with new technologies that are more sustainable, that can really open up uh, the future uses. And transportation, as you mentioned, is one of them. Another one is grid-scale energy storage. Uh, so when you think about transportation and, and the wonderful revolution that we're seeing in transportation with all kinds of new technologies, the electrification of transportation, making, making really great headway, and we need to support that and, and push that as far and as fast as we can, there are some forms of transportation that are not as easy to electrify naturally, usually things that are heavier duty, marine, heavy duty trucking, uh, aviation, international aviation in particular, which is a major uh, carbon emitter. And just to give everyone a sense of the challenge, I mean, uh, you know, back in those days when we used to go to the airports uh, frequently, you know, go to SFO, you're, you're looking to fly to Frankfurt, Germany, and the plane comes in, it deplanes, they clean the aircraft, they reboard the new crew and passengers, and, you know, an hour and a half, they turn that, that thing around and head right back to Frankfurt. And during that time scale, uh, if you just calculate the fill-up time of jet fuel that's going into that vehicle, into that aircraft, it's about a gigawatt nuclear power plant's worth of electricity if you want to convert it into those units in about one hour refilling that thing uh, to give it enough energy to, to travel from SFO to Frankfurt with you know, 300 of your, of your close friends around you. Uh, so that's kind of the, what's marvelous about fuels in general and chemical fuels. And, and so hydrogen can absolutely play a role. And, and we need lots of new tech development in this space. It's certainly electrification of the processes to make the hydrogen. So you can take renewables to make it. But you also need to distribute it, to transport it, to store it. And there's all kinds of technical uh, challenges in these domains, many of which, of course, we're working on here at Stanford and at SLAC at the National Lab, as well as many others out there. And, and so the future really is bright as, as new technological developments, and also I should say for the consumption and use of the, of the hydrogen as well, fuel cells and other forms of technology can, that, that can employ that hydrogen for transportation or for other applications. Um, the outlook is equally bright, I'd say, for grid-scale energy storage with the, the very simple premise that once you put the time and effort in to make a molecule, 
storing it as a piece of pie uh, compared to other forms of storage. You can store it for an hour, a day, a year, and that chemical can retain its chemical structure and you can use it when you need to. So this, this really serves as a native uh, kind of application for you've got renewable electricity now and you want to store it for a season, for a year. That, that can be accomplished uh, with molecules uh, such as hydrogen. The question is, can we get that to be cost effective enough? And so certainly many of us are working in that space as well. Um, I'll wrap up really with my, my second point, and, and that is to say that everything that I just said about hydrogen, we can imagine that same dialogue happening with other molecules. Uh, so ammonia is, is an important one. That's, uh, that's where the hydrogen goes to make ammonia, to feed p billions of people across the earth. So we're talking about new technologies to sustainably produce ammonia, to sustainably produce plastics, to sustainably produce building materials, to sustainably produce carbon-based fuels like gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. So everything that I just mentioned about hydrogen, we can imagine electrifying processes to make these other important molecules. And, and that will, I, I hope and expect, it will naturally plug in to uh, a world in which we have renewable energy uh, costs that are dropping and deploying at larger scales really help mitigate all of the challenges that we're seeing in terms of demand and, and uh, the time shifting of that demand, seasonal storage, et cetera, while also providing the molecules that we need for society. So thanks again for the opportunity to participate. I'll wrap up here and look forward to the Q&A ahead. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Tom. So we're going to shift gears now. But before we do that, I just want to recap and, and I just want to make it clear um, some main points that um, it's been really extraordinary, the progress that has already been made in renewable generation in batteries, you know, you heard great examples and energy efficiency, and that we have so many technologies that can cost effectively be deployed today. To, on our pathway to the clean energy transition. Uh, so there's just all the reason in the world for optimism and, uh, you know, and that's renewables, efficiency, CCS, grid, batteries, hydrogen. Um, and to, to, in the words of the, the great uh, George Schultz, um, who it's, uh, it's his 100th birthday, um, either today or tomorrow. Um, you know, he said about technologies, there are those that are here today and there are so many that are here today. Um, there are those that are coming soon. And I think we've heard about some of them that are coming soon. And there's some that are on the horizon, like being able to make uh, you know, gasoline uh, from purely renewable resources uh, and, and CO2 captured out of the atmosphere. So lots of, lots of reason to hope, but technology isn't the only part of the story. Uh, we need to think about policy as well. And so to do this, um, we're going to transition uh, back to you, Lynn. I'm gonna turn the tables and start with you. And you served as the US Under Undersecretary for Science and Energy for over two years. Uh, you were the founding director of the Precord Institute at Stanford. You were also the founding uh, director of the Global Climate and Energy Project. And, uh, and you led the School of Earth Sciences uh, as dean. So that you have a tremendous experience uh, in leadership, both in the government and academia. So, so from your perspective, what are the approaches, the mechanisms or standards that we can use to accelerate the deployment of this incredibly wide menu of technologies that we've just been talking about. Uh, Sally, it's uh, it's such a uh, a good question. If if there's any lesson that has come home to me in all of it, my checkered employment history, um, it's that uh, the uh, the technology is is crucially important that we need to. Uh, to deliver these, um, these technologies at scales that are really quite large. Um, but that, uh, and that depends on cost reductions and all the engineering and science that goes into that. But equally important and maybe more important and maybe tougher uh, to deal with is uh, the, the combination of policy tools that we need to, to uh, implement all of that. Um, it seems unlikely that we're going to have uh, something like a carbon tax uh, uh, here in um, um, in the U.S. at least in, in the future. But I think the good news is that there's a rich uh, uh, opportunity space of other uh, other options. You know, there are uh, policies at, at state and regional levels. There are um, regulatory systems. 
uh, market structures uh, and financing all play really important roles. And we need as much creativity um, in designing all of that um, uh, as we go forward, uh, as we do on the technology side. Uh, and the good news is that we have coming up a series of, uh, of uh, uh, faculty speakers who have uh, uh, deep expertise in that side of it as well. So uh, I think I'll shut up here and, uh, and we'll, uh, uh, let's move to those who actually know what they're talking about. Okay, well, uh, first up will be uh, Deborah Sivrath, Sivas, who is the Luke W. Cole Professor of uh, Environmental Law Director um, and the Environmental and Natural Resources Law and Policy Program, also the Director of the Environmental Law Clinic, a Senior Fellow at the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, uh, she's an environmental, uh, leading environmental litigator, and her litigation successes include challenging the Bush administration's gas mileage standards for SUVs and light duty trucks. So uh, she is the perfect person to help us think about the, the transportation sector. Um, while there's been a great deal of progress in decarbonizing the electricity sector, if you look around the United States, at least, we haven't made the same kind of progress in the transportation sector. So it's such an important issue. So, so, so to, to Deborah, you know, what are the challenges we need to face and the policies that we need to develop in order to expedite uh, the facilitation of cleaner transportation systems and, and thinking both of more efficient combustion engines, but uh, as well as EVs and, and hydrogen vehicles. Well, uh, thank you, Sally, and I'm so happy to be here. This is a great discussion. I've learned a lot myself. Um, so I, I will, I think of these challenges in, uh, so, and I would just say that the transportation sector is so important because about 28% of the greenhouse gas emissions generated in the US come from the transportation sector. So it's important to really um, bite down on that. And as, as we go forward here, I think of the uh, uh, challenges as, as three kind of interrelated buckets of ideas. So the first is um, continuing technology improvements, which we've talked a, a fair amount about here today, changing consumer behavior, and related to both of those is designing the regulatory and economic incentives um, to, to get where we wanna be in the future. I won't, uh, we've heard a lot about the technology side. I will just say in the, um, in the, the focus has really been on electric vehicles, although as we heard from Tom, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are also still in the mix in terms of the regulatory structure out there. And really the big, uh, the big breakthroughs are coming in battery technology. I will say we, we had one of the first Nissan Leafs on the road, you know, the battery was, took you 80 miles, you know, if you kept the heat off and drove slowly. So we're, you know, we're doing much better in, in, that, um, in that domain. And, and, and I think we're also now seeing the market um, uh, develop for heavier duty vehicles, trucks, and buses. And that's important because about 23% of all transportation related greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the US are from that sector. So it's important to see those improvements too. I would just, just one final, on the technology side, one final point is we need to be, um, as these uh, breakthroughs go forward, we need to also be thinking about the life cycle, which we've talked about some here, of these products, right? Because it depends on what, where they're manufactured, where batteries are manufactured, what is the what is the electricity source um, in, in those locations, and also where they're being used and driven, both for electric and um, uh, how the hydrogen fuel is being produced. So we need to think about all of that in the mix. It's not very well built into our policy structure at this point, right? Policies are um, often kind of a blunt instrument. And so uh, I think those are things we'll, we'll want to think about more in the in the future. But then turning to the second bucket, kind of consumer behavior. So we have seen a real ramp up in production of uh, especially electric vehicle sale, uh, new car sales. And um, but but even even so, it, it's still a tiny share of the market, a little over one percent in the U.S. market. Probably a lot of that is here in California and and something like. 0.2% of the worldwide market, right? So, so even as we're seeing the technology um, improve and, 
and uh, and sales increase, we, we still need to do giant leaps forward and try to hit some tipping point where we're um, really changing uh, consumer behavior. In my view, that's the real breakthrough is going to come when we get the manufacturers on board. So for the, for anyone who's ever watched a TV commercial, they're very effective at selling, you know, SUVs and and other uh, uh, high profit vehicles, right? So so I think it's really going to take getting the private market on board um, with with actually marketing and selling these vehicles and and you know getting their dealerships where cars are sold maybe less and less these days as we're all locked down but get getting their dealerships educated about um, these vehicles because there's been some surveys done where people walk into dealers and uh, and they don't know anything about the electric cars in their in their fleets. Um, I think there are a lot of exciting new models on the horizon. Things have slowed down a little bit during the pandemic, but I, I think we're going to see as consumer choice opens up, um, battery life increases. And if we can bring the manufacturers along, which we're, we're starting to see, we're going to we're going to um, we're going to facilitate that market. So third is is really the regulatory incentives, both um, both uh, kind of command and control regulations and market incentives on both the producer and the consumer side, and this is really being led uh, for the large for the, for most part right now by the states and California in particular, with a lot of states then following along with California um, on the on the uh, on the. Uh, the producer side, the California has its clean car program, which is an evolving program. It's been uh, evolving over the last 20 years. And it's really a mix of aspirations. So California now has a um, goal of no uh, new fossil fuel vehicle sales by the year 2035. That's in line with some of the European nations, Norway, um, the UK, France, India have all set similar aspirational targets, right? You, you still need to have the policy to get there. So in California, that's a mix of um, increasing uh, f fleet fuel economy standards. So that's both EVs and, um, and better, uh, a better fuel economy out of uh, internal combustion engines. And then also a zero emission vehicles mandate. So that's where in California, there's a requirement, the requirements going forward, depending on the manufacturer's share of the market and uh, the year on the trajectory out uh, uh, for some percentage of the new car sales to be zero emission vehicles. So those are, um, those are some of the incentives that California has put in place. For those of you following politics, there has been, uh, there has been ongoing litigation with the um, federal government, which has tried to pull back on California's ability to do that. There are some 10 other states who've adopted California standard only standards. Only California can set those standards uh, in, to be stronger than the national standards, but um, uh, uh, about 10 other states have followed suit and, and that's been embroiled in litigation. I think what we're gonna see with the changing of the administration is that litigation is probably gonna go away and hopefully the federal government's gonna step in and, and really step up on, um, on fuel economy standards. Just on the, just a final point on the con consumer side in California as, the, as at the federal level and many other states, there's, there's a number of um, different types of financial incentives, rebates, for certain types of EVs and hydrogen um, fueled vehicles. Uh, some of these are phasing out. Uh, some are arguing it's too early to phase them out since we have such um, low penetration of the market. Some of them are being adjusted so that they're not available to higher income consumers or those buying higher income cars. As the price, as battery technology, as we heard, is gonna uh, improving and the cost is falling. And as the price of, uh, electric cars comes into parity with internal combustion cars. I, I think those um, those rebates will be less important, but right now they're still important in in um, pulling people into the market. And one final point: the other, you know, big w when the surveys are done, one of the big considerations is infrastructure, and in particular, charging stations. Right, and the whole idea of range anxiety and. Uh, even if batteries are going f further than they used to, people want to know they can you know, drive drive out of town and, and find a place to charge. And, and there are also incentives being built into some of these policy programs 
to um, to both incentivize public, more public charging stations, so rebates in developing those charging stations, and also incentives that we can build into um, the residential electricity rate structure, so that people can, um, for instance, do off-peak uh, charging of their vehicles at a relatively low price. Of course, all of that is facilitated if we have a grid driven by renewables, but um, that's a that's a uh, some of the uh, policies that are out there and where we should be thinking forward. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, uh, Deborah mentioned that uh, 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 all the electrification op options and uh, we're certainly going to need to uh, be able to deliver the electricity to do this. Diane, let's uh, Let's come back to, to you. We, we started this conversation with uh, opportunities in energy efficiency, um, but, but you have a, a lot of experience in the regulatory structures for electricity markets. How, how do those need to evolve um, as the new generation mix and the, and the new grid that uh, Ram's uh, working on uh, emerges uh, um, uh, to provide power for all of this? Sure, thanks. Um, short answer is we need a lot of change in our, our markets. We can go all the way from, there's wholesale power electric markets, which are transparent way of really having between the buyers and sellers of the electricity that is produced um, at the utility scale. And we don't have those any everywhere in the world at all. Here in the West, we have tried for, I think, 40 years to get a Western interconnection um, wholesale market developed. We've made some progress, but we don't have that. And that's really critical for lowering our costs, bringing on lots of renewables, um, uh, dealing with, I think, issues like cybersecurity, where you can combine resources, ensuring there's enough for resource adequacy. So literally just getting markets established is still a big challenge. The second thing, though, is the market structures that we have, they were really developed to think about lowering costs through competition, which is great, and enhancing reliability. But when we're looking at a carbon constrained world, um, we need to think about how can those markets evolve so that they're working in sync with our climate policies and not at odds and types of resources being selected. And so um, there's a lot of work to be done that I think is actually very interesting to think through of how can we blend in carbon policies into the traditional market st structures we have. The other area I'll mention quickly is something that you've heard everybody talking about today is we've got a lot of new technologies coming in to play in the energy electricity sector. And the rules that we set up originally for markets were really a type of technology. Our coal plants, our natural gas plants. And many of the new technologies are far different. So we have to change our market structures so that literally they don't discriminate or prohibit the use of our new technologies, but that there's at least a level playing field. And I'm also very interested in as we have this ongoing flow of new technologies coming in, um, how do we get from just the pilot stage to more widespread usage? And can our markets be a better player in this? So there's a lot of work that does need to be done in terms of markets. Some of the solutions we know, and we just have to sort of get the policies in line, but there's a lot of good work that does need to be done on what are changing market structures we wanna put in place. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Diane. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to a new topic. And that is basically, how do we pay for all of this? How do we pay for all these new technologies? And energy infrastructure is very capital intensive. So getting good financing is really critical. It has to be at the low cost, it has to be um, you know, widespread and so forth. You know, If we think about all the power plants, transmission lines, charging infrastructure, factories to build the solar panels, factories to build, you know, we heard about how many uh, giga, giga factories we're going to be needing. So all of these require enormous investments and on the scale of trillions of dollars per year. So to talk with us about this, we have uh, Tom Heller, 
who is an expert in international law and legal institutions. He's the Lewis Talbert and Nadine Hearn Shelton Professor of International Legal Studies Emeritus at the Stanford Law School. He's also the faculty director of our Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance, and also the faculty director of our Sustainable Finance Initiative. And his research focuses on the rule of law, international climate control, uh, and so forth. So, uh, so Tom, um, what needs to happen to enabling, uh, enable and financing at the scale that we're talking about, not only for individual components, but for energy systems that we've been hearing about? And, and this is going to be crucial, not only in the US, but really much more importantly in developing economies around the world. Yeah, thanks, Ellie. Um, always left with the... Uh... The best questions, you know, the usual way you hear about this in politics is the people who advocate for something say, well, it's good. Now it's now it's just money um, and uh, problem solved. Uh, not quite. And so what I'd really like uh, the uh, the participants in this uh, discussion uh, and in the audience to keep in mind as we move through our four topics that uh, are just the beginning of discussion. First thing I'd like everyone to just plant away in their mind is um, the turn to risk, okay? The, what, does, what does that mean? The second thing I'd like to uh, plant with you is it's the downside, okay? It's, there's an upside and a downside whenever you're dealing with risk and change. And remember from this, it's the downside. The third point, a lot of people have already made, it's critically important and particularly on the upside, it's the system. It's not necessarily just the physical infrastructure, it's the system. And the last thing, which is perhaps the biggest challenge of all, for two, is this discussion is about US policy, which is certainly going to change. But the last point is it's Asia, okay? And how we are going to engage with, with Asia to deal with the uh, set of problems that uh, that we are all discussing. So let me just make some principal points about each of these. What do I mean by the turn to risk? I mean, it's the way we talk about and think about action um, concerning climate. Uh, it has increasingly become in recent years a question of measuring and managing risk. And of course that takes you to finance because what finance is really about is the structuring and the distribution of risk. So turn to risk is number is, is the first thing I'd like to talk about. Lynn mentioned at the very beginning of his second presentation that uh, we're unlikely to have carbon pricing in the US that is through, through some sort of carbon tax or a substantial trade and tax system. That's general across the world. There is carbon pricing enacted in more and more places, but it's far too low cost. It's variable where it is and it has relatively narrow scope. So many of you in the audience, particularly those thinking about investment, will, be, will realize that we have increasing private market pressures for disclosure, for disvestment, uh, divestment, for thematic funds of one kind or another. And the, the sustainability um, uh, finance initiative here at Stanford is working heavily on a bunch of issues that have to do with greenwashing and noise in the private markets, the signals you're getting, transparency, all of that is really interesting. There are increasing industry standards, but what you will see over the coming years is the increase in mandatory regulation of these markets. Um, that is going to come internationally through uh, a coalition of central banks, but it will come also in the US through stress testing, increasing emphasis on macroeconomic and prudential policy and work by the Fed or the communities, um, um, uh, commodities trading, uh, commodity futures trading uh, commission, which work is already underway. So a shift in the way we are discussing things. On the downside, most new studies that are coming out trying to say, are we in line or not in line with the Paris agreements or other uh, plans to move toward a low carbon economy. And what we're finding is we're not doing that badly across the world in building out the upside, the renewable plants, the physical infrastructure associated with that. But on the downside, we are not closing down 
the fossil infrastructure at nearly the pace which is necessary. We can easily see this in the United States where although we've closed down more than half the coal plants that existed a decade ago, the only ones that have been closed down are those that were no longer being compensated for their capital. In other words, it's where the cap, where the amortization of the capital was finished that we've closed them and beyond that they're still operating and indeed even at increased levels. So I think what you will hear more and more about in this coming period is what we could call transition risk or downside risk. And just to introduce that topic, um, think about the th different kinds of risk that are at play here. We obviously have the physical risk in the short term, which is coming from increased hurricanes, increased fires that we're all very well aware of, that risk is basically locked in because of concentrations in the atmosphere already for the short run risk. In the midterm, the risk starts to shift to transition risk, by which we mean the value of assets, the know-how of workers, uh, the, the, the specialized capacities of different uh, companies and the way in which that risk may be affected by changing risks of technology, changing risks of policy, all of which have been discussed. And the key point that I'd like to leave you with is in the long run, the physical risk, which scientists have detailed beautifully in the, uh, from, the, from the increasing uh, temperatures and extreme events that climate represents, the long run physical risk is a function of how we manage the midterm transition risks. They are not separate. And as a consequence of that, you need integrated analysis. That integrated analysis has a number of challenges, both institutional and analytic. And the ones that I just would highlight if we had further discussion are people behave strategically. People, nations, communities behave strategically and they try and move the risk from their balance sheet to the balance sheet of someone else, often sovereigns. That makes that risk harder to manage. Secondly, most of the risk that we are facing, certainly in transition, is very concentrated and immediate losses, while most of the gains on the upside are very diffuse and future gains. That makes it difficult either for public or private finance to manage. And finally, as someone has recently said, the gearbox for understanding physical risk um, is really quite different from the gearbox, the metrics, the modeling of transition risk. It involves measuring uncertainties in the future, moving as Mark Carney says, from snapshots to videos and providing the toolbox to deal with it. Because of time, I'm not going to talk about the system risks directly, um, but it has to do principally with the difference between financing and um, uh, distributing returns between hardware and software. We're doing well on the hardware side, generally. The software side, the data, the analysis, the communications of systems integration, which many of my colleagues have spoken about, lags, lags in the United States and elsewhere. And my final point, which I think is critical, not just for, for the world's uh, climate situation, but for our own work in the US is my point that it's about Asia. Why? Basically the cost of gas, as Mark described as a transition resource um, is, is high in Asia and gas supplies are limited. So the choice remains largely between various forms of low carbon energy um, and, and coal. And we all understand the, the significance of that as, a, as, a, um, as, as a, 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 an area for dealing with climate policy. The second big problem is the coal fleet and the infra infrastructure fleet in Asia is young, which means it is not amortized, not written off as it has been in the US and particularly under the laboring of effects of, of COVID, uh, debt management is already very difficult uh, by sovereigns and corporates across Asia. Um, they cannot easily take on substantial writing off of the cost of the fleets, which since they are built by state enterprises and state banks, largely fall on the state's balance sheets. And finally, the question of data, communication, 
um, analytics. These are very important in the key countries of China and India without any doubt, but they are certainly all subject to security issues in their diffusion. And so we will see substantial and already see substantial industrial competition that will make the financing of this and particularly US contribution to the Asian transitions uh, particularly problematic. So let me stop there and thanks very much for the opportunity, Lynn and Sally. So uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, you've raised lots of, of, of complicated issues that are going to require a lot more thought. Um, we're going to start now with uh, questions from the audience, um, and there are plenty of them. Uh, and so I'm going to start with one that's uh, that's that's an interesting way to think about the the problem. We've we've spent a lot of time talking partly about um, decarbonizing electricity and how that might flow into things like uh, uh, transportation. Um, on the other hand. In some cases, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, making fuels. So, um, uh, and the, the distinction between those two is that that, that fuels, um, uh, in a way, fuels are an energy storage medium that we use by combustion. Uh, we we might carry the fuels around uh, with them with in a vehicle or uh, store them like hydrogen. Uh, 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 for use in making electricity. And how should we think about that balance? And in particular, how does that balance um, work with uh, the uh, determining how much we invest in things like renewables um, uh, and a lot of grid to support all of that versus um, making the fuels and figuring out the storage side of those. So, um, so uh, it's a it's a hard question, and and now I have to select a victim. Um, uh, Tom Jaramillo, maybe you could uh, you uh, you you talked uh, about a version of this. Maybe you could say a word, and then uh, then I'll get uh, uh, maybe uh, Rom or uh, or De uh, or Diane maybe as a. a a grid uh, representative into this. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lynn, for that question. Great question from the audience. You know, it's uh, that you've highlighted some of the complications. And I think the first thing that I would say is that there's no such thing as a plug and play solution. And maybe we don't want a plug and play solution. So we know what the world looks like today. We know how we use energy today. And it's, it's convenient to think about developing technologies that could, you know, be hot swappable with uh, something out there and, and providing something that's cleaner and more sustainable, et cetera. But I don't think that's the right way to think about it. What we really want to think about is what does the future look like? Uh, what does the future landscape look like from a technology perspective? What does it look like from a business and finance perspective? What does it look like from a public, public policy perspective? We need innovation in all of these things. And we need to, to, to think about what the, the future should be. Where should we be in, say, two decades, three decades? And that's what we should be uh, aligning our, our, our efforts towards, as opposed to trying to just simply replace what we've got in the ground now. Um, and, and then it's really, so thus, it is about really integration, and we have to think of things at the systems level. Uh, and it's hard to do that because we don't know what, what that future holds. So uh, what I would say is that at the moment where, where we're at is uh, we've got a lot of options, uh, thanks to the efforts of many people who are really developing all kinds of different things, uh, whether it's on the technology side or on the society side, or on the policy side, on the economic side, and really just kind of developing different modes and different possibilities. And now that uh, where we're at today in 2020, say, versus where we were in the year 2000, we have a lot more information. We have a lot more development in lots of different areas. The, the future is still uncertain. Uh, and, and we'd better, if we haven't started already, start thinking about, you know, how these systems are all going to work together, because that's how our current, that's, that's a big reason why our current system works so well. That's why a gallon of gasoline costs only $3. It's marvelous what we can get uh, the value out of $3 uh, towards what a gallon of gas can get us. So uh, how do we do that with, with everything else? I'll, I'll pause there and let others chime in. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh Okay, I think that's um, that. That actually covered the waterfront uh, uh, pretty well there. Unless Ram, do you want to say a word about the the uh, um, the the grid side of that? Yeah, uh, very quickly. I think um, this type of conversion technology 
um, can serve as a basis for a long-term, long-duration storage, um, but it all depends on um, the efficiency of the process. Uh, yeah. Aside from that, uh, whenever you have a technology where you're converting electricity from for some other use and you have the possibility of time when that electricity is used, um, that flexibility can be very... Yep. Hmm. All right. Sally, go ahead. Yeah, maybe I'll just be really quick and, and think about this from the perspective of the electricity grid. So we and many others around the world are now using something called capacity expansion models to try to understand what's the most cost effective way to meet electricity loads. And I think what we all find is that basically electricity needs to consist of three components. One is renewables. The second one is uh, energy storage, particularly short-term energy storage for things like peaking. And then the third thing you need is clean, firm power. So with regard to clean, firm power, there are different ways you could get it. You can use CCS plus natural gas combined cycle. You can use nuclear. Uh, and you can use zero carbon fuels, you know, as we're discussing here. And it turns out that once you have even one of those things, you can significantly reduce the overall cost of decarbonizing electricity. So from that perspective, you know, zero carbon fuels, you know, can be a, a very important component of this. So, uh, and, and then the other thing we find though, is that if you have two of these technologies, it's even cheaper. If you have three, it's even cheaper. So I think this really argues for a diversification of our, our ways of producing, storing, and converting energy uh, back into electricity. Okay, I think I'm going to ask the next question. Is that right, Lynn? Is that yes. where we are here? Okay, so uh, so this is going to be a question for um, for Yi and uh, and Ram, I believe. So. The question is, is that, you know, clearly EVs are taking off and, and scaling quickly, but we also need a lot of energy storage for the grid. So to what extent and re what really are the prospects are trying to use EVs as energy storage for the grid or often it's called vehicle to grid. Um, and, and either one of you can jump in first, but I think you both have different perspectives on this. Ryan, do you want to take it first or do you want me to? Jump in first. E, why don't you go first? Yeah. So, Sally, this is a great question. Uh, the uh, vehicle to grid. Um, I, I was in short answer is we have to think about vehicle to grid for sure. Uh, if we don't think about that, we are wasting huge resources right there. But I also mentioned a, a few challenges right there. Um, well, I just look, use California as an example. We have about 15 million vehicles on the road. And our electric car will easily get to a million, probably getting close right now, zero emission one. Soon, well, a million. Let me take a million as an example. I, I will take an average of uh, a million vehicles, 100 kilowatt hour battery pack for simple estimation and order of magnitude. So we have 100 gigawatt hour of storage capacity right there. Using CO5 as the C rate, slow rate, so we have 20 gigawatt of uh, possibility we can tap into. That's basically a baseline roughly in the order of California electricity consumption, 20 gigawatt, right? But certainly it's a dark curve, it fluctuates. So if we don't think about using vehicles, I think we are wasting huge resources. Then what are the challenges right there to really think about that? It's communication with the data, right? The bits and watts initiative in the RAM will probably touch upon. The, you know, the, how do we coordinate all the behavior? That's one. This regulation hurdle right there and how do we you know, use regulation and financing model to do that as well. And also let me come to the, uh, you know, the battery challenging, the challenges right there. In order to do that, your battery life needs to be long enough. If your battery life is only a thousand cycle, hey, I think as customer, I don't want my electric car to be used to contribute to the grid storage, you know, back and forth many times. I want the battery life to, to be su sufficiently long in order to manage this charging, this charging cycle. Of course, it will be a shallow cycle, shouldn't be a deep cycling. So there's multiple consideration needs to come in in order to enable that. But I would say thinking about vehicle to grid is absolutely needed. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so does Ron want to weigh in on on that on sort of the grid management side and you know, sort of? Yeah, that? I I think there is uh, two key points to kind of enable um, vehicle to grid, um, which is it definitely has has an important potential. Uh, the first one is uh, how reliable, how predictable, how much predictable capacity of storage you will have at any given point in time. Um, it will depend on usage patterns, people's preferences, and how you know you compensate them for allowing their car battery to be discharged. Um, the second key point I think is um, that generally integrating EV flexibility into the grid um, needs to have, as E pointed out, much better integration of information, data, you know, data about the state of charge of the car, uh, preferences, availability, uh, but also information and data about the network to which this car is connected. So the transformer, distribution network constraints, and so on. Um, so there has been a lot of experiments on this and, and demonstrations. And the question is, how do we do this at, at large scale um, and a low cost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could I just uh, ask uh, the, uh, uh, what I think is a quick question is, uh, um, so, uh, and this will be for um, the electrochemists. Uh, what role do you see is for fuel cells uh, going forward? Is uh, uh, are those going to appear in vehicles? Will they uh, be part of the grid generation uh, um, kind of setting? Uh, I don't know who's who's right for that. Uh, I don't know Ram or Yi or Tom, <laughs> uh, Tom Jaramillo. Um, um, not to be Why don't you, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to dive in first and then uh, certainly would like to hear perspectives from others. Um, the, the future is looking really good for a number of reasons. Uh, I'd say first and foremost, um, there's a, a, a hydrogen. So first of all, there's lots of different types of fuel cells. So let me be clear about that with different types of fuels. And so there's a lot of different variations on that theme. The one that is uh, growing the fastest is hydrogen fuel cell state of California, there's over 8,000 um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles on the road and growing. And part of the reason why that technology is moving really well, a uh, couple of things. Number one, hydrogen, as I mentioned, is already a large uh, big ticket molecule that we're, we produce left, right and center. And so uh, it's, it's readily available. And number two, really, the car companies have put a lot of investment in reducing the costs um, of that technology. And so where that technology is today uh, is about $40 a kilowatt. Uh, so if you want to size the engine of a car um, and, you know, if you you know convert from uh, horsepower is what we use in the United States, but most of the rest of the world uses kilowatts, call it a 100 kilowatt engine. So 100 kilowatt engine times $40 a kilowatt gets you about $4,000. Uh, and so now it's, it's hitting a price point that is uh, very reasonable for that sector of light duty vehicles. Another major force is uh, the electrification of vehicles in general. A fuel cell car is in fact an EV. It's an FC EV. You can think of it really as, a, as an EV, a standard battery EV, where you shrink down the battery and you put on a large range extender that gives you fast fill up times and, and longer distances. And so now that is what I would call that within the transportation sector, that is the toughest market for hydrogen to really have a value add compared to conventional technology. And it's already making gains. And then the question is, what's the prospects ahead? Because those technology, the hydrogen fuel cells, using chemical fuels as a means for storage has a lot of advantages compared to, to the other forms of storage out there, especially, uh, and those advantages become even greater, uh, the heavier duty the transportation gets. So aviation and marine uh, and trucking, et cetera. So, uh, so I think that looks bright. We don't, again, we don't know what the future holds. Um, I think we'll be a complementary technology. I think we'll continue to use uh, carbon-based fuels in some technologies. We'll continue, to, we'll use electrification in other uh, direct electricity and batteries and, and fuel cells definitely have a lot to offer, not only for hydrogen, but also as other fuels and other uh, hydrogen fuel cell technologies improve. I'll leave it there. Okay. You, you want to wanna add anything? Yeah, let, let me add a little bit. So I agree with Tom. I, I, I think the batteries and fuel cell are highly complementary technology. They have their own strength uh, right there in the transportation in the long distance, heavy tracking you know, for fuel cell. I mean, it's worthwhile to pro deeper. And for the also the grid scale storage as well for the long duration, but people need to look at the power needed. 
uh, carefully. I mean, for long duration, hydrogen is amazing a media right there. And then if coupled with fuel cells, uh, uh, with some more advancement, I mean, the, the, this is highly complementary to, to the battery. It's worthwhile to, to really look into a lot more. Okay, so uh, so I think we're going to shift uh, bases again and thinking about the electrical grid and you know, we can imagine all different kinds of grid, but one version of the electrical grid is that we would have long distance, high voltage transmission uh, for decarbonizing the electric electricity sector. So what an example would be is that we've got lots of wind in the Midwest that we could bring to the East Coast, or we've got lots of solar energy on the, on the West Coast, which could be brought to the, to, to the Northeast, for example. Uh, or in Europe, one could even imagine the Sahara Desert, you know, providing power up to up to uh, Northern Europe. So, uh, so to weigh in on this question, I'm going to ask two people. One is sort of Diane from the perspective of what we think these grids might look like, and then uh, also to uh, Tom Heller, I'll, I'll ask him about you know financing these kind of you know mega infrastructure projects. You know, what are the prospects for that? So maybe uh, Diane to you first. Sure, happy to take this on. Um, as Sally mentioned, before joining um, Stanford, I was a commissioner with the California Public Utilities Commission. And one of the areas that I focused on for six years was the building permitting and financing of long distance transmission lines. And that was a focus point of California to get more transmission infrastructure built. And we did succeed. We got over $6 billion of new transmission built, all of which carries renewables to California. But I can say nobody likes transmission lines <laughs> near them. Um, so our quandary is that study after study shows um, unless we really take advantage of these deep resources that we have, not just in the United States, but in many places of the world to build large scale wind power plants, uh, wind farms and solar, um, and then have the transmission to take the power to our cities and places where it's needed. It's going to be a much more expensive system to build just small scale renewables um, uh, basically on our rooftops. And this is a quandary that we have, but all the studies show we want to frankly have both, but we do want more large scale renewables. And for that, we need renewables. We don't have time to go into this, but especially in the United States, all the efforts that have said, let's do it top down, have people in Washington, DC, draw a map with a line, and then we're gonna force states and regions and people and our native um, Americans to just accept these lines fails. And so in my view, um, we have had some very successful efforts in the United States where there was funding from the federal government, but it was much more a stakeholder driven process where we had honest, transparent analyses on costs, environmental impacts, uh, timing, et cetera, to think about transmission lines. And then you really need to have a very focused political support to make it happen because these do take many years, but um, I think it can be done. It's necessary in my mind throughout the world to build more transmission, um, but it's a far cry from just developing the new technology. It's a lot to do with thinking about um, uh, the um, political side. And then as Tom's gonna talk about the financing side is critical. Yeah, and, and Tom, as you're thinking about your remarks, um, you might also think about China, which has been, you know, proposing sort of this super grid, this Asian super grid. Yeah, yeah I think Sally, I got it. I, I think that the questions have highlighted, as well as the answers, um, some of the major dimensions. I argued in my, uh, my introductory remarks that we probably around the world have passed the point where investing in more physical renewable projects, facilities, um, has declined in value partially because they're cheaper and the private markets can finance them than putting especially public money into, into software and, and, and operational characteristics. The other things I would stress 
um, are, are these, these answers to where you get productive investment and whether it's fuels or grid uh, is, is very much a function of where we see other policies going. In other words, to the extent we see a general economic transformation that is moving toward IT and the introduction of IT technologies, it's a very good idea to piggyback our energy investments on those wider system changes. That being said, um, I think these solutions are local as, as you imply. Um, we did build an interstate highway system um, in the 1950s in the US, largely with federal money and, and, and state matching money. Um, and I suppose that could be applied to the grid, but our experience in, in, that, um, in, in, the, uh, in, in the development of, of regional and even state solutions in the US um, has not been very successful in that area. And of course, we have a legal system that makes it particularly difficult. And just to highlight the points that um, I was making that solutions are probably going to be relatively local or regional, China is a great example. They do not have problems in running uh, a, a transmission system that goes all the way from Xinjiang in the West down to, uh, uh, down to Guangdong in, in, in the East. Um, and they have emphasized this very heavily, but in point of fact, it's been a real uh, difficulty for them because it's increased the capacity to move coal generated power um, throughout, throughout China and increasingly talked about for doing it throughout Asia. Um, so the, 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 the questions that I think are, are, are remain really critical it, are, are the institutional questions. In China, it turns out that power lies overwhelmingly in the energy system at the provincial level. So the central government has been very good at building out this integrated grid with long distance transmission lines, but on the whole, power decisions are still being made at the, um, at the provincial level. And so much of that grid capacity is not moving and a great deal of renewable power that lies in the north and west of the country is not moving to the south and east. Um, on the other hand, it is clear to me that hydrogen that Tom was talking about earlier has become a major concern in China if for no other reason than they are basically generating from coal heating in much of the cold weather parts of the country through combined heat and power and they have a district heating system to move that's already in place. So they are much more interested in hydrogen. And I think what this calls for is not international coordination in R&D, which has also proven impossible, but realization of where different countries have different advantages and structuring our own R&D programs around those that are um, most uh, beneficial in the US context, thinking about our own economic transformation going forward. So, uh, so a number of, uh, of uh, audience members have uh, asked a question that I think is on lots of uh, people's minds. Uh, uh, Yi, you mentioned that uh, um, uh, there's a, in order to, to meet apparent uh, or at least possible demand for batteries, we'll need lots of, uh, of battery manufacturing, then that implies mining, but it also uh, raises the question of how batteries get recycled. Uh, so, so where do we stand on that? And and Deborah, maybe then we'll come to you and ask about the 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 sort of the the question of the environmental impacts and the regulatory side of what that might look like. So, Yi, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Um, the uh, recycling of the battery is extremely important. You know, the energy we are talking about, it's a so, so big, this scale problem. We cannot say we keep mining our resources, but not thinking about re recycling. So indeed at Stanford right here, we, we recognize how important this problem is. We recently uh, started to launch of a consortia, you know, um, in, in, inside the storage X about circular economy of the uh, the battery thinking about from beginning of mining and to the manufacturing to all the way to the end of the life before the end of the life of course repurposing could be important taking the ev batteries used for the grid and but this require your battery life is long enough at the end of the life to do the recycling taking out the valuable uh elements you know material like 
cobalt, nickel, lithium, you know, ut really utilizing those uh, very well. This needs to do the whole life cycle analysis from economic sense, from the technology sense. This is, this is extremely important. I, I would say encourage the audience, you know, I, I know we have more than a thousand people right here listening and to think creatively, how do we better do that? I, I'm glad, you know, many people recognize this, how important this problem is, and we need to put our heads together. We have no other choice but thinking about the circular economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, uh, I think that, that comment could be applied to just about all the, uh, the technologies we've talked about. Uh, Deborah, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yes, I'll just I'll just weigh in briefly, right? I, I think this is such an important topic and it's not really on the radar of a lot of policymakers, right? Because that we're on the front end, how do we incentivize getting, you know, electric cars on the road and that's incentivizing battery technology. So so and we're not really good as a society thinking about the back end and these kind of circular economy or life cycle analysis of products. So I think one of the things that um, it, it is necessary is to get this on the radar of policy people really and connecting to, 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 to people at Stanford and other places who are doing this work to understand the importance of this. We can, we can develop regulations that would deal with this and make um, those uh, recovery, recycling and recovery mandatory, but we don't have any of that in place now. So it's so important to educate even our policymakers about the back end of, of the life cycle. <clears throat> Okay, we, we actually have uh, two minutes left. Uh, Lynn, would you like to wrap up or do we wanna go for one more question? Oh, let's go for one more question with that. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, so this is gonna be for Tom Heller uh, and I'll be really quick. Uh, so, you know, banks and investors don't really like financing projects that rely on subsidies to pay them off. Uh, the subsidies could go away. They, you know, they create perverse incentives for investment and so forth. So, you know, given that we you know need huge investments you know are there ways around this what's your strategy for you know getting more money into into the clean energy sector yeah uh great one for the last 30 seconds of the uh, of the discussion um uh, it is true that particularly with regard to uh uh innovative hardware uh, and, and new clean energy technologies, the markets have reacted quite badly uh, to, the, uh, to the volatility of subsidies, no question about it. Um, although we have financed a huge amount of physical infrastructure in a short time on that, on that basis. Um, I, I would say the critical questions are, are thinking seriously about infrastructure development, which was all public or largely public until not very long ago, and under the terms that one that that are now being discussed, whether under the idea of a green new deal or what or, or whatever other terms are are put on top of uh, of this, I think there is a serious need, and it will be taken up in the current administration, to think about um, infrastructure investment, uh, which can be done through a number of of, of different financial mechanisms that move uh, some of the risk, particularly those associated with zero marginal cost services like, like uh, renewable energy um, onto, onto the public books, um, whether it's in China or whether it's here in the United States. Well, uh, alas, uh, our time uh, has come to an end. So I'm, uh, uh, there were lots more questions and, uh, and lots of uh, uh, thoughtful people uh, think, uh, contributing to the discussion. So we, uh, we thank you all for that. We thank the panelists. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and for everybody else around the world, we hope the, that you've, you've found the Global Energy Dialogues this and this one as well informative and relevant uh, during these times. We have a big uh, energy transition underway here uh, and a lot more needs to be done. So the Global Energy Dialogues will um, take a break uh, for the remainder of December and then resume in January. And we hope you will um, uh, all uh, rejoin us then for what promised to be a series of very interesting conversations. 
Um, I think um, we have uh, one final uh, slide here. I'd like to just uh, um, make an announcement or maybe it's an advertisement. Um, we've created a program called the Stanford Energy Innovation and Emerging Technologies Certificate. Um, this offers uh, courses online on storage, energy efficiency, grid modernization, the future of fossil fuels, and lots of other energy topics. Um, the four folks uh, pictured on the slide are all participants in the conversation today. Um, and if you look at the uh, link that's sh uh, shown on the screen, um, uh, you can, uh, or you can ser search the Stanford website for more information and in, in all of this. So that will conclude our broadcast today. Uh, on behalf of the entire Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy, we thank you for joining us. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next time.